Let me tell you this. If you will let God do something right now, he will do something amazing. That is always the case, but given everything we've been jumping through today, there has to be some kind of reason for it. So let the Lord have his way today. You're going to have to imagine the slides today. Shouldn't be too hard. There's going to be a tree. There's going to be fruit. And then there's a bunch of words. Okay, well, let's go ahead. We'll turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 35. Can you check and see if this has been opened? Or you could have opened it. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. That should not be a surprise to you. We're going to revisit after that Psalm 37, verse 23. And then for good measure, we'll move to Psalm 19, verse 7 through 11. You can probably just move to that last Psalm right now and quote the rest of it from heart. But here we go. Matthew 22, verse 35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. How much of the law? How much of the prophets? All right, that's quite a bit, isn't it? So Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And then turning to Psalm 19, 7 through 11, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Uh, Lord Jesus, you know the situation. You know what you intend to do. And you know how we intend to resist you. I ask that you would work in our hearts to help us to submit ourselves to you. To allow you to have your way in our lives. That we might be pleasing to you. That we might walk worthy of you. And we might walk in your righteousness. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you for standing long enough to make me realize that I hadn't prayed yet. Have you ever walked across an unfamiliar room in the middle of the night with the lights off? How did your toes like that? Even at my house where I know where everything is, I still use a light to walk around at night. My toes are just that valuable to me. God's Word is a lamp unto my feet. It allows me to see where to put my feet and how to avoid breaking a toe. Have you ever driven down the highway at night when all the street lights are out? It's a little bit unsettling, isn't it? Have you ever driven down a backcountry road where there are no street lights? That's even more unsettling. Now imagine driving down that road without headlights. Not only would that be unsettling, but that would also be very dangerous. Now imagine doing that wearing sunglasses. God's word is a light unto my path. It is the headlights that let me see where I'm going. 
It keeps me on the road and out of the ditch. Living without God's Word leaves us in spiritual darkness, even more surely destined for destruction than driving down pitch black, windy roads without headlights. Have you ever walked outside into the backyard when it's pitch black without a flashlight? It makes you wonder if that garbage bin is really a bear. I was walking back home from fishing one night. I was in the deep woods. I mean, deep for around here. And all I had was my cell phone flashlight. And that's not very good at seeing the path in front of you. But I'm walking, and all I can think of is that picture I saw on Facebook of the hunter with the deer and that giant bear behind him with the red eyes. And, and I know better than to think that there's a giant bear, like a Kodiak bear here uh, in the woods of Connecticut, and yet my mind was saying, there's a bear. And so to calm my, myself, I pulled my little bang stick, and I'm walking along, and and all of a sudden, I see a shadow just skitter across, and it freaks me out. And if I didn't know how to use bang stick safely, I would have gone bang. And then I realized that when I took a step back, the thing skittered in reverse. And I took a step forward, and it skittered forward. And I realized that my flashlight, where the two eyes were gleaming at me, was really due on the leaves of a small bush. And so I was literally jumping at shadows. His word is illumination in this world. It helps us see what is what. It lets us put our imaginations to rest and to see what is real. We're continuing the spiritual health check, focusing now on the feet. Last week I did an intro titled, Walking in God's Ways. Today I want to look closer at what it means to align our steps with God's commandments. Because we cannot love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, all our strength. And we cannot love our neighbor as we love ourselves if we are busy running off-road into ditches and even worse, headlong into destruction. So this one is titled, Walking in Obedience. In His infinite wisdom and love, God has given us commandments in Scripture to guide us and instruct us on how to live in ways that honor Him. And if we do so, we will receive His blessings. We see that in Psalm 19.7, through 11, which tells us, as we read, his instructions are perfect and they revive the soul. They make the simple wise and they bring joy to the heart. See, life is not easy and there's plenty to be upset about, but if we follow his commandments, we will find renewal, strength, wisdom, and joy in his word. There is a great reward and a great comfort to be found when we walk in God's commandments. One of the reasons it is so essential for us to follow God's commandments is that our obedience demonstrates our love for Him. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so we see that our obedience is linked to our love for Him. It thus follows that if we are not keeping his commandments you can say it with me we do not love him you don't have to say it with me it's okay he tells us in john 13 24 a new commandment i give unto you that ye love one another as i have loved you that ye also love one another you know we already saw this in the Sermon on the Mount, when God took these Ten Commandments that don't let you do anything fun, and then He said, but I say unto you even more so. I'm only, I'm only kidding about the fun part, all right? But now He says, the greatest and first commandment is love God with everything you've got, and love your neighbor as yourself. But now I say to you, love one another as I 
have loved you. I'm telling you today, you do not love yourself as much as the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. You can't make the sacrifices necessary to get into the shape you want to be. And he laid down his life for you. I said you because if I say we, that's a little too personal, and then I admit that I'm, I'm not doing any exercising. He tells us something even greater, even harder, even further in depth than loving our neighbor as ourself because now we have to love one another as the Lord Jesus Christ loved us. And we find it hard enough to love our neighbor as ourselves. And now we have to go even farther loving one another sacrificially. But obedience to this command to love one another demonstrates our love for him. He goes on to tell us in verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my, my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Loving each other sacrificially as the Lord Jesus Christ commands us demonstrates to the world that we are His disciples. He commands us to love, and when we love, the world sees that we are His. If we love Him and are grateful to Him for all He has done for us, then our obedience should flow out of our love and gratitude to Him. Also, when we align our steps with God's commandments, living our lives in accordance with His will, we will experience the peace and freedom of walking in His will. Psalm 119 tells us that those who follow God's precepts will find freedom in that guidance. We see that in Psalm 119.45, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. We see that in verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We see it in verse 133, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. We see that in 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There is peace and liberty in walking in his will. And as we submit ourselves to him, he will lead us in the paths of righteousness, and he will give us wisdom, and we will receive blessings. As my favorite psalm says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not uh, lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Purpose and joy can only come from aligning our walk with the will of God. Aligning ourselves in his paths of righteousness by following his precepts, will allow us to experience true purpose, seeming irrational joy, and a peace that passes understanding. When we walk how and where he guides us, we find that we can walk in liberty, free from the sickness and chains of this world. God's unwavering commands provide a stable foundation for our lives in a world of confused and constantly, or a world of confusion and constantly changing advice. His instructions are wisdom, and they illuminate the way forward. When we follow his guidance, it brings us honor, joy, and peace. And as God's beloved children, we need to carefully prioritize exploring his word so that our actions are in harmony with His loving guidance for living. And sometimes it seems impossible to determine what all of God's commands are. And this is why He simplified it for us, highlighting the two intertwined principles of loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. Nonetheless, as we saw in John 13, it's clear that the Lord also gives us more detailed slices of this general principle. We can look at the Ten Commandments, which, which are all summed up in those two. 
God so graciously wrote out Ten Commandments on stone for Moses. And Moses broke those tablets, so God made him chisel out the next ones by himself. And that was a teaching moment for Moses, but that's also a teaching moment for you and me. Because if we despise what God has blessed us with, we're going to find out that we have to make it up all ourselves. If we throw away his blessings, we're not going to get what he would have given us. And we see this, Adam and Eve found this out when they went from the bountiful garden of Eden to having to slave away to eke out food from the earth. So getting back to Moses, these Ten Commandments provide clear guidance to the Israelites after God had delivered them out of Egypt. Notice that after deliverance comes a list of commandments. Because freedom does not remain free if you do not follow the steps that the Lord has laid out for you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Paul tells us that. He testifies of this in 2 Corinthians 3.17. But that also then would indicate that where the Spirit of the Lord is not, there are only inevitable chains and destruction. God gave Israel the Ten Commandments, providing essential principles on how to relate to God and one another. And the first four commandments are about our relationship with Him. All are applications of the first commandment to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And They tell us not to have any other God before Him, not to make idols, not to misuse His name, and to remember the Sabbath day. And these all highlight the importance of reserving worship to the one true living God and treating Him and His name with respect and reverence and setting aside regular time to focus on Him. The remaining six commandments are all about the relationship among people, honoring parents, not murdering, not committing adultery, not stealing, not giving false testimony, not coveting. And these commands all protect the sanctity of family, of life, of marriage, of property, of reputation, of your your emotions. They forbid both inward and outward attitudes that could harm others. And so these are simple laws, right? They're easy to understand. And uh, even though the, the, the rich young man, when uh, the Lord told him to follow the commandments. He, he listed off, the Lord didn't list off all the commandments. And so the young man was able to say, I followed all of these. But these are simple commandments and, and easy to understand. But in the Sermon of the Mount, as I just mentioned, the Lord consistently expanded on these laws and demonstrated how the Israelites had managed to keep the statutes while violating the principles. If we keep the principles and we live our lives based around these principles, it is pleasing to God, and it is a blessing to our community. Imagine how much better life would be if even half the people on this earth followed the commandments of God. Except for the speed sign. The speed limit sign is not a commandment from God. That's a, that's a suggestion for the, for the faint of heart. But these commandments demonstrate God's value and give us clear guidelines on how to protect our relationship with Him and with others. And, and I've got four other uh, commands that I want to explore briefly today. The commands to, uh, to forgive, to serve, to give, and to make disciples. So living out God's love through the command to forgive, serve, give, and to make disciples. Uh, these commands are at the heart of Christian faith and practice. And these are not just obligations, but these are, are pathways to a life that reflects the love and teachings of Jesus Christ. So at the heart of the Christian message is the call to forgiveness. In Matthew six fourteen through 15, Jesus teaches, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your your Father will not 
forgive your sins. And this commandment reminds us of the forgiveness that we have received through Christ's sacrifice. And it's an invitation. It's not even an invitation. It's a, it's a commandment to uh, extend that forgiveness to others. As he told his disciples in Matthew 10.8, freely you have received, freely give. The Lord also demonstrated forgiveness for us repeatedly. He forgave the sins of the paralyzed man in Mark 2, uh, chap, uh, verse 5 through 12. He forgave the sins of the uh, woman who anointed his feet with oil and tears in Luke 7. And Most strikingly, when he was on the cross, he looked at the people who were cheering his painful execution and humiliation and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is rarely... Forgiveness is never easy. It requires letting go of resentment, bitterness, and the desire for revenge. But it is through forgiveness that healing and reconciliation can take place. When we forgive, we reflect God's grace and His mercy. We allow His love to flow through us. And it's a transformative act that frees both the forgiver and the forgiven from the burdens of the past. And, and you, I hope, remember Bishop's teachings on forgiveness and how critical it is for us not to put a barrier between us and someone else and certainly not between them and God. So forgiveness is a call. It's part of our, it's an obligation in our alignment with God. And service is another critical means of living out God's love. And Jesus himself set the example of servanthood when he washed his disciples' feet in John 13, 1 through 17. And he taught that the greatest in the kingdom of God is one who serves others. And we see that in Matthew 20. And some might try to attain greatness and false humility and servitude, but God judges the heart. It's the one who serves out of love for God and love of others who is truly the great among us. And as Christians, we are called to follow in the Lord Jesus' footsteps of service. Service is an expression of love in action. It involves putting the needs of others before our own, just as Christ did on the cross. And whether it's serving our families, communities, churches, or whatever it may be, acts of service demonstrate our love for God and our neighbors. And through service, we become instruments of God's love, touching lives and making a positive impact on the world. Telling someone, be ye warmed and filled, neither warms them nor fills them. They remain cold and hungry, but giving someone warm clothes and a place to warm up and giving them food to eat, those are things that make a difference in this world. We're called to serve. We're also called to give. And generosity is a hallmark of living out God's love. In 2 Corinthians 9-7, we are reminded each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, giving is not just about financial contributions. It, it includes giving our time, our talents, and our resources to bless others. Grandma Hill used to say, give it with warm hands. And the meaning there was that you can't take it with you. And when you die, someone else is going to get it. So you might as well give it while you're alive, to enjoy blessing them. God's love is abundant and overflowing. And when we give generously, we reflect His nature. Generosity is not driven by obligation, but by a joyful response to God's love. It is an act of worship and an act of gratitude for all that God has provided. And through our giving, we support the work of the church, we assist those in need and we participate in the mission God has called us to to bring hope, transformation, the gospel to the world. We're called to give. We're called to make disciples. 
The command to make disciples is a commission given by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And this command is known as the Great Commission. The Lord tells us, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I, commanded, I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And this command is an invitation to share the life-transforming message of Christ with others. Making disciples is about nurturing and mentoring others in their faith journey. It involves sharing the gospel, teaching God's word, and modeling a Christ-like behavior. It's about teaching others to emulate Christ. And when we make disciples, we are not making disciples of ourselves. We are to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do so, we become part of God's plan to draw people into a relationship with Him. And it expresses and demonstrates God's love for the lost and His commitment to see lives changed by His grace. And this is a vital command. It's not just vital for us, but it's critical for those who we would otherwise not disciple. And Jude illustrates the urgency and the criticality of this in the 23rd verse of his epistle where he writes, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So the commands to forgive, serve, give, and make disciples are a roadmap for living out God's love in the world. These commands reflect the essence of Christian faith and practice. These commands guide believers in how to relate to God and to others. Through forgiveness, we extend God's grace. Through service, we embody His love. Through giving, we share in his, the blessings He's given us. And through making disciples, we participate in His mission. By embracing these commands, Christians experience a deeper connection with God. And we can become conduits of His love and we impact or affect the world with acts of compassion, grace, and give them and uh, enable the Lord to work in His transformative power. Aligning our feet on God's path essentially emphasizes living in obedience to God and following His will. Bearing the fruit of obedience is a natural and tangible result of being in alignment with Him. And this fruit reinforces our commitment to walking that path that God has set before us. Aligning our feet with God's path reflects God's character. It positively affects others. And it demonstrates our belief, which is our faith, our, our knowledge of God in action. And the spiritual fruit that follow walking in God's path essentially proves that we really did say, not my will, but thine be done. And that we didn't just say it, but we actually lived it. Paul writes to the Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And without getting too drawn into the topic of fruits of the Spirit, let's take a quick jaunt through this bountiful orchard. And so, if you would take a little flight of fancy with me, I don't normally do this, but let's imagine a tree, straw, or straw, strong, tall, thick, lush, and green. And that tree represents a life lived in obedience to God. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So this tree we are imagining is this person that Jeremiah describes. 
It's a healthy tree and it's constantly yielding fruit. And so as we look at these fruits, we see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and temperance. And the first fruit mentioned is love. Love is the heart of God's character. We're told that God is love. And when we align our lives with His commandment, we naturally grow in love. And this love extends beyond just affection. It's, it's selflessness. It's compassion. It's sacrificial love and caring for others. It's that kind of love that Jesus demonstrated throughout His earthly ministry, loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgivable, touching the untouchable, and extending grace to all. The fruit of joy arises from a heart at peace with God's ways. Obedience leads to a, long, to a deep-seated joy that is not dependent on circumstances, but is anchored in the presence of God. It's the joy that Paul and Silas experienced in a prison cell while they sang hymns of psalms, or hymns of praise, rather, to God, even though they'd been beaten and sore, and even though they were in chains. That joy is the joy that you feel when His presence surrounds you and for a moment you lose sight of this earthly world because all you can feel is the warm love of your Father. The next fruit is peace. Obedience brings inner peace, a tranquility that surpasses understanding. It's the peace that reassures us amid life's storms and knowing that if we walk in God's path, eventually he will see us through. And this peace extends to others as we become peacemakers, striving to resolve conflict, learning to turn the other cheek, learning to how to answer softly to turn away wrath, and learning to promote harmony. The next fruit is long-suffering, Long-suffering or it could also be described as patience. And this is a fruit that grows as we submit ourselves to God's timing and plan. And you all know better than to pray for patience. God gives you that request by giving you the opportunity to learn to be patient. But just as God patiently bears our imperfections and our stubbornness and, and our... Uh, We'll just leave it at stubbornness. We learn to be patient with others and we learn to give them room to grow and change. The next fruit, gentleness, flows from a heart that has experienced God's gentleness. When we align with God's commandments, we become gentle in our interactions and start using our words and our actions to build up rather than to tear down. We're, we remember when the Lord looked at the woman caught in the act of adultery. And instead of being all stern and formidable, instead of being harsh with her, he simply said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. We remember how softly he spoke to the woman at the well of Sychar. Forthright, but not harsh. You're right. It's, you, said, you said well that you have... No husband, because you've had seven, and the guy you're with isn't your husband. Points out the truth, but he does so with gentleness. And when we learn to see just how gentle the Lord has been with us, the natural extension of that is for us to learn to be gentle with others. The next is goodness, and goodness results from a life dedicated to doing what is right in God's eyes. It's the kind of goodness that prompts us to help those in need. It's the kind of goodness that helps us extend kindness to strangers and helps us to, or causes us to live with integrity. And we have faith, and as we walk in obedience, our faith deepens. We, uh, we know that faith is our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the person, identity, and plan of God. And we learn to trust in His promises and lead on His guidance. It's the, it's the knowledge of Him that empowers us to step out in obedience even when the path seems uncertain. And meekness is understood oftentimes as weakness, but in fact it is a strength that is held under control. 
It's the ability to surrender ourselves and our will to God and humbly serve others. Temperance or self-control is a fruit that enables us to resist temptation and to make choices that honor the Lord. It's self-control that helps us navigate life's pleasures and pitfalls with wisdom. And so returning to this mental image of this fruitful tree, the spiritual fruit laden down the branches with goodness. And together they create a harmonious and balanced life that reflects God's character. Just like a tree's fruit nourishes all those who eat of it, our lives, when filled with the fruit of obedience, become a source of blessing to those around us. We become conduits of God's grace when we embody love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And what that means is when we act like the Lord does, we allow Him to act through us. Our interactions with others are marked by grace, kindness, and a genuine desire for their well-being. That's what love means. We are no longer driven by selfish desires, but motivated to desire to love, or motivated rather by a desire to love and to serve as the Lord Jesus Christ did. And so even more, the abundance of spiritual fruit that we bear is a testimony to the transformative power of God works in us when we align our steps with His commandments. And this becomes a compelling witness to the world. It draws others to the source of this rich harvest, uh, which is a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Bearing the fruit of obedience is not just a religious duty. It's a profound reflection of God's revealed character in our lives. So as we obey God, as we follow His commandments, we cultivate love, joy, peace, and other virtues that touch those around us. And as, a, as we continue on, we, we start to become a source of blessing to the world at a time when the world so desperately needs God's love and goodness. And so to kind of give some practical steps on aligning ourselves with, with God's path, seeking His will is foundational. We turn to Psalm 25, 4 and 5, where he, he writes, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Actively seeking God's guidance and wisdom in our daily decisions is an act of humility. It's recognizing that our human ways are faulty, that our understanding is limited. It's like using a GPS on a road trip. We trust it to know the best route. Similarly, similarly, we should trust God's guidance even when we can't see the entire journey. Just as the GPS adjusts our way steering us away from obstacles and traffic jams, getting us to our our destination, when the voice from heaven whispers, go straight, go straight. Because unlike GPS, God will not send you to the George Washington Bridge no matter where you're going. The next step is to listen to His Word. Isaiah 30, 21 says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. And when he turned to the right hand and when he turned to the left. Through the Holy Spirit, God provides gentle nudges and warnings when we stray off course. The Holy Spirit helps us recognize and correct our steps. Imagine having a wise friend who gives you invaluable advice when you're about to make a wrong choice. Like if when I decided to stick my finger back into the socket to make sure I really was getting shocked, somebody had said, hey, John, let's just assume that that tingle in your arm and the way you could move for a couple of minutes was, in fact, electricity and just flip the breaker. That would have been good. Similar, I got to stop saying similarly when I type because I can't say it. I can only type it. 
In the same way, we should heed God's guidance as if it were coming from a faithful friend who not only has our best interest at heart, but actually knows what they're talking about. We can trust his guidance. Sometimes he says, go through the storm. And I don't know what kind of mean person would say, go through the storm. But he knows what's best. And he says, this is the way to the best result. This is the way to the perfect result. And if we follow him, he will keep us through. The next step is to study scripture. We should dive deep into the word of God to understand his commands and his principles. As Psalm 119.105 said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Scripture illuminates our way. It provides us clarity and guidance. We should next evaluate life choices. This is one thing that humanity is so blind on. But we should reg- regularly evaluate our life choices and our habits in light of God's commands. As 2 Corinthians 13, 5 instructs us, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. So self-reflection and self-examination while being attentive to the whisper of the Holy Spirit are vital to ensuring that we stay aligned to God's will. I will also point out for your edification that Paul did not say examine other people whether they be in the faith. Prove those bozos. He says examine yourself. And I would warn you, the moment you start to judge somebody else's salvation, you are placing your own on very shaky ground. Next, we should rely on the Holy Spirit. We need to lean on that indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost for guidance on how to apply His commands each day. And Jesus assures us of his Spirit's role in John 16, 13, where he said, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Trust that the Holy Spirit indwelling you will lead you into all truth. Trust that he will lead you into making choices aligned with his path. And the last step is to support one another. We should foster a community of believers who hold each other, who provide accountability and encouragement. As Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 encourages us, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Because we need each other, and we can help each other, we can edify each other and uplift each other, and together we can help each other stay on the path of alignment with God's commands. So seeking God's will, listening to his word, and practicing these, what I hope are practical steps for aligning our our steps with his path. Are, these are integral to living a life that reflects God's character and follows his perfect path. So just as a traveler relies on GPS to get him to a place he, they've never been before, and just as a, a, an intelligent person trusts a wise and faithful friend's advice, we should rely much more on God's guidance and trust in his wisdom, knowing that his path leads to life and abundant blessings. So as we wrap up this little journey through aligning our steps with God's commands, I would like us to reflect on the profound wisdom and guidance that His Word provides. When Psalms 119.105 says, 
that his light is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. It's not just a pretty phrasing, but it's a road map. It's an illustration of what his word should be for us. And, and his word is not just a bunch of very uh, wonderfully written prose, but it is life itself. It is that road map. To align ourselves with God's commands, we must actively seek his will in our daily decisions. And, and so we must start with humble prayer. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. So when we seek his guidance, we acknowledge the limitations of our own understanding and the perfection of his ways. And furthermore, we should be attuned to his gentle whispers and warnings. Isaiah 30, 21 tells us to listen to that voice that says, this is the way walk ye in it. So in practice, aligning our step with God's commands involves diligent study of Scripture to understand His principles. It involves evaluating our life choices in light of His commands, and it's relying on His Spirit to guide us in daily living. And we are also encouraged or instructed to support one another on this journey as we had seen in Hebrews. So as I close this lesson, remember that each step taken in alignment with God's commands brings you closer to a life filled with His blessings, purpose, and the fruit of the Spirit. So let your life be a living testimony to the transforming power of walking in God's ways. Let it be a testimony bearing us fruit and illuminating the path for others to follow. In every decision, in every interaction, let God's commandments be your guide. And let His love shine through you as a beacon of hope to a world in need. And so I invite you to come to the altar and reflect on the health of your spiritual feet. Are you faithfully following His path? Are there areas in which you need realignment? Have you become complacent about getting a little too close to the shoulder? And you need to seek out some adjustments. So I invite you to the altar. Seek guidance from the Lord. You can find strength in His presence and let Him illuminate the areas in your life where you can follow Him more fully.